G'day everyone, it's great that we can uh, still do this, it's a privilege to be able to share God's Word with you now. Uh, We're continuing in our series through Corinthians and tonight we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14 to 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14 to 22, I'll read that to begin and I encourage you to get your Bible and uh, look on as we go through this passage. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 14. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel... Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the, t- the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? Let's pray together before we look at this passage. Our loving Father, we come now and we ask for your help. We ask for your help to understand. We ask for your help to apply all that we will hear. Uh, We pray, God, that we wouldn't be hearers of your word now. We pray that we would would be doers as well. And we pray that you would transform us. We pray that you would turn our eyes from worthless things, the many distractions that we may have on our mind right now. And we pray that you would turn our eyes and our hearts to your word. Please, God, give us life through your word. Give us hope. Remind us of Christ and all he's done and transform us so that we would flee from idolatry and live lives that honour you. And we pray this all for your glory. Amen. We often talk about idolatry as Christians, how we put other things before God and let them take priority in our lives. But I fear when we talk about idolatry, we sometimes see it as an acceptable sin. When I hear people share about this sin in their lives, they talk about it in, in a more relaxed way. There's no seriousness to it. They don't have much urgency in sharing about it. They don't seek accountability for it to overcome it. They aren't desperate to kill it. Um, And they don't think idolatry is a very big deal in their life. Yet when people talk about other sins, maybe sexual sins or anger issues or abusive tendencies, there is seriousness in these sins and there's an urgency to deal with them. And I think we need to realize that idolatry is a deadly serious sin. It's probably the deadliest sin there is, and yet we fail to see it in our lives. In verse 14 in our passage, Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. He's showing the deadly nature of idolatry straight at the beginning because he commands the Corinthians to flee from idolatry. Flee from it. Run from it. Get away from it. Verse 13 has just before this, it's just said that God will help in times of temptation. But alongside this comes this call on us to flee from idolatry. Flee because God has given a way out, as verse 13 has shown. And do not, do not go near it. Flee far from it. There's urgency to this call that Paul gives us. Don't look around when idolatry comes. Don't dawdle, but run. Flee from it. Run. And when we realize this when we see this drastic response that is needed to idolatry, we realize it is because it is such a dangerous sin. There's grave danger in idolatry. When the temptations of idolatry come, we need to realize there is serious danger and we need to get out. It's like, we're, it's like being stuck in a house that is burning. Uh, the walls are burning up and the roof is about to cave in. Or it's like being on a beach and we hear news that a great tidal wave is coming in the next few minutes. If we hear that, we know we're in danger. We don't just stand around. We don't dawdle. We run. We get out of there. And if we don't, we know we're going to die. And that's how deadly 
idolatry is. Now, why? Why is idolatry so deadly? Why must we flee from it? Well, Paul says, verse 14, he says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. He says, therefore. He, he's showing here and saying that I've already given reasons why idolatry is so deadly. Look at the damage and destruction that it brought to the Israelites. As Ian showed us last week in this first part of chapter 10, many of the Israelites lost their inheritance because of idolatry. Idolatry impacts eternity. It's deadly serious. But also, idolatry is deadly, I think, because we don't see it as deadly. Something is often uh, more dangerous, and some of the deadliest things in life are often the ones that we don't see that are dangerous. The things we don't see and realize are dangerous can often be more deadly. Also, idolatry is deadly because it is a subtle sin. We often only see a fragment of the idolatry that is in us, and it even becomes so accepted amongst us and in our own lives. And also, one more reason why idolatry is so deadly, it's because it's at the root of every sin. There isn't a sin that idolatry isn't behind. Idolatry is why we sin. We always break the first commandment in the Ten Commandments and seek other gods before we then go on to break another command. And that's why Paul here, he must address the Corinthians head on because some of what they are doing is idolatry. In chapters 8 and 9, Paul has been showing elements of Christian liberty and he's been speaking a lot on this. But here in our passage, Paul is addressing how the Corinthians have gone too far. They've fallen into idolatry. He's, he's already talked about how they may be able to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols and they may be able to buy it from the markets. But he said as well, for the sake of their brothers, they probably shouldn't do this. But in this passage, Paul takes up a more particular situation and he's addressing the situation where they are eating and taking part in pagan feasts where the worship of idols is occurring. They are eating at the tables of demons, we're going to see in our passage. And this is idolatry, and they must flee from it. So we're going to look at the nature of the Corinthians' idolatry and what it is like. But before we do this, there's a danger for us. There's a danger that we might put ourselves beyond the idolatry that the Corinthians were facing. And that we won't see this sort of idolatry is in us. So before we go any further, we need to see clearly what idolatry is and how it pervades our lives too. What is idolatry? Well, put simply, idolatry really is worshipping anything other than the true God, prioritizing something over Him, thinking and acting like something matters more than God and thinking that it will bring greater fulfillment. But also, idolatry is worshipping the true God, true God in a wrong way. We saw this with the Israelites often at times. And we see this much today as well, I think, sometimes in so-called Christian churches. But what we see here is if this is what idolatry is, then idolatry pervades our lives as well. What are our idols? Well, our modern idols probably aren't as clear as some of the idols that the Israelites faced, where there were stones and statues set up at times. But we have many gods that are just as horrid. What are they? What are some examples? We have the God of education. People are obsessed with degrees, even getting that good ATAR, and everything is put on hold in life because that's the priority. We have the God of entertainment. It's a temple in our homes that people sacrifice all their time to. We may not beat and cut ourselves to worship idols like people did in the past, but we ruin our bodies and lives with entertainment addictions that rob our time and destroy our usefulness. Well, there's the God of career, where people sacrifice their children, sacrifice their families to the God of careers and success. There's the God of health, safety, security, where we're devoted to protecting our lives and possessions, bound to medicine and insurances and protecting our safety. As a God of pleasing people, which we are so bound to, people are obsessed with fame, popularity, a good body image, and they just make every life decision based on what people think about them. People who just focus so much on 
posting, constantly posing to please others and have people look at them. And one more, there's the God of pleasure as well. We know this one so well. People don't think about others very much. People are so selfish in this world. And is all that matters is them and what they want. They can be whatever gender they want. They can enjoy the pleasures that they want, even if it might mean killing a baby through abortion. What matters is them and what they want. And there are so many other idols too. Really, everything besides God can become an idol. Even ministry, church buildings, families, money, hobbies, these things can become idols in our life. Everything can take the place of God. Anything that we worship, devote ourselves to, or cherish more than God is an idol in our lives. So I say this at the outset before we look at the detail of the Corinthians idolatry so that you don't put yourself beyond this idolatry here. Idolatry is in us. And I hope you, as you sit there, can think of even some of the idols that are in your life right now. So beware of the idolatry that is in you and flee from that idolatry, as Paul says right at the beginning in verse 14. And as we read this passage, don't think, I don't have idolatry like this in me. Don't think, I haven't eaten at the table of demons. Because some of you possibly have eaten at the table of demons just before listening to this sermon. Or even all of this day and all of this week, you have devoted your life and have been obsessed with everything but God this whole week. We, like the Corinthians, have idolatry in us and we need to see the true nature of idolatry and why it is so deadly. And to do this, Paul does a few things here. He first brings up two situations in verse 15 to 20 and he shows that the Corinthians and how they're participating in these pagan feasts, these idol feasts, how what they're doing is idolatry and demonic. He shows that in verse 15 to 20, and he does it by calling on them to think in verse 15, then by raising a couple of questions to get them thinking, and then explaining what he's doing in verse 17. And then he does that process again. In verse 18, again, he calls them to think. He raises two questions again to get them thinking, and then he explains himself again in verse 20. And that's where we will see our first point, how idolatry is demonic. But then in verse 21, he shows that idolatry doesn't fit with being a Christian. And then in verse 22, he shows that idolatry angers God. i just give you that as the, the big overview of the passage before we look at the detail, so you can see the flow as we work through it. These are the points that Paul is going to show us. And he's going to show us why idolatry is so deadly so that we would flee from it and run. So firstly, why is idolatry so deadly? Well, idolatry is participating in the worship of demons. Verse 15 now, verse 15 to 20. Here, these five verses, they really work together to build up to this point, and Paul keeps arguing to get to this point. And he begins in verse 15 by giving this call for them to think. He says, verse 15, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. We've already seen in Corinthians how they thought they were wise. The Corinthians thought they were wise, and Paul calls on this. He asks them to think and see that he is right in his reasoning. They need to see that Paul is right. That's what Paul wants. And so he makes here an argument to show he is right in what he is saying. And he appeals to two things. He appeals to their understanding of the Lord's Supper in verse 16 to 17, and their understanding of Israelite sacrifices in verse 18. And he begins here at verse 16 saying, look at the Lord's Supper, look at what you understand of the Lord's Supper and see how this idolatry that you're involved in is so wrong. So have a look at verse 15. He asks here two questions. He says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Now, the key to understanding this verse here, and really the rest of the passage, is that word participation, which is used several times. It refers to fellowship or sharing in something. And that's what we see there. Paul says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation, a sharing in the blood of Christ? Now, we also need to realize that the NIV, it calls it the cup of thanksgiving, but it could probably better be translated the cup of blessing. What Paul wants them to see is blessing comes in the Lord's Supper. 
when we take the cup of the Lord's Supper, we proclaim that we have aligned to Jesus, that we share in Jesus. We share in his suffering. We share in his, je- in his death and all that that has achieved. And when Jesus died, we, we see that we share in all that he's done. That's what it is to be in Christ, to share in all that he has done. When I share in Christ, I have my sin forgiven. I have my debt of sin paid for. God's wrath is dealt with. I have his righteousness given to me. That's what I have when I share in Christ. And in the Lord's Supper, we proclaim that union in Jesus. And we proclaim that we share all the benefits that come from being in him. And then Paul goes on to say the same thing about the body. The second half of verse 16, he says, And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Now, Catholics here, they believe about this, that we literally share in Jesus' blood and we eat his physical body when we take communion or the Lord's Supper. But as I've already said, the sharing that's being talked about, the participating that's being talked about, isn't referring to a physical sharing, but it's referring to an experience of the blessings that we have in Jesus and are reminded of when we take communion. And I think the rest of this passage makes this pretty clear as well. For one example, verse 18, have a look there before we'll get to it later, but have a look in verse 18. It says, Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate or share in the altar? It's not saying that those, the Israelites who partook and shared in the sacrifices, that they physically ate part of the altar or got part of the altar. It's not saying that that happened physically. But it's, it's saying that they spiritually shared in what came when the sacrifice happened on the altar. They, they spiritually shared in the blessings that came in what was happening on the altar. And when we share in the Lord's Supper, we're proclaiming all that Jesus has done and we're sharing in all that he has done spiritually, not physically partaking of his body in any way. And so here... We see in the Lord's Supper, we share in Christ through our union with Him. But also, a sharing occurs in the sense that we share with one another the blessings that we have in Christ. Together we are united as God's redeemed people under Christ. And so in the Lord's Supper, we're proclaiming what we already have. We're not gaining anything. We're not gaining what we don't have. We're merely proclaiming what we already have in Christ. And Paul is using all of this, all these arguments about the Lord's Supper, to show why the Corinthians joining in on those pagan worship feasts is idolatry and why it's so wrong. To do so, to join in on those feasts, is to participate and proclaim what that feast stands for, just like we do in the Lord's Supper. By eating, the Corinthians are uniting in that feast with those who are worshipping idols. And they are uniting to what that feast celebrates, the idol that that feast celebrates. And so they are affected in some way by it. And they are not to think that they they cannot be affected by partaking in these idol feasts. And we too cannot partake in idolatry. We, We cannot pursue what the world pursues, seek what the world worships, without thinking that we won't be affected and caught up in it too, and celebrate what the world celebrates, and worship what the world worships. And I think in verse 17, Paul makes this point even clearer. Have a look, verse 16. We'll just read verse 16 again, and then into 17 he says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Now, Paul says there's one loaf. That's referring to Jesus. And we partake from that one loaf. And therefore, we are all one body. All who are united to Christ and have faith in Him partake from Him, that one loaf, and are together, therefore, one body, united, belonging to Him, and together as one body. And Paul wants us and wants the Corinthians to connect this to idolatry and see that when the Corinthians join in those feasts, that are worshipping idols, they are uniting with those people who are worshipping those idols. 
And then Paul gives us one more example in verse 18 to further solidify his point. He says in verse 18, he brings up this point of the Israelite sacrifices. And again, at the beginning of verse 18, he calls them first to think. Verse 18 says, Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? So again, he calls them to think and he draws their minds to how the Israelite sacrifices work. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices were made on the altar and the people would eat from these offerings. And to eat from the sacrifice of the altar was to enjoy the blessings that came from it. It was to show that you're uniting with all that is being done and all that is resembled by the sacrifice on the altar. And it is as well, it is as well to become a part of that people who together are worshipping Yahweh. And so when they take part in these idol feasts, it means that they're doing the same. They're uniting in what that feast stands for, and they're uniting together to worship that idol. But Paul sees he needs to clarify something here, because he doesn't want the Corinthians, or us, to think that idols have some sort of power and value. And so he says in verse 19 to 20, these two questions. Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. Paul wants them to know idols are nothing. That block of stone is nothing. It does not have power. It does not have worth. There's one true God. Idols aren't divine gods. But don't think nothing is behind them. No, says Paul, there are demons behind idols. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 16 to 17, Paul says a similar thing about the Israelites. He says, They stirred up Yahweh to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods that had never known, they had never known, to new gods that had come recently whom your fathers had never dreaded. When the Israelites worshipped idols, Moses saw they're actually sacrificing to demons. And here, for the Corinthians, Paul sees, as they are eating at these feasts and the temples of pagan gods, it's not something they should be doing because they're actually participating at the table of demons. They're actually involved in the worship of demons, which is idolatry. Any worship that is not directed to God is the worship of demons. Do you realize that in false religions? False religions are the work of demons. They're not not just created by the minds of men. Demons are at work in false religion. Also, we need to realize that demonic powers are at work behind idolatry and the gods of this world. And that shows us why idolatry is so deadly. And that's what Paul wants them to see first and foremost. Idolatry is so deadly because idolatry is demonic. It is the worship of demons. So don't be blind to the demonic world. It is surrounding us. It is not as distant as we think. And we need to realize that there is demonic forces behind idolatry. That's the first point. That's why idolatry is deadly. Idolatry is demonic. Secondly, verse 21 now. Why is idolatry so deadly? Well, idolatry doesn't fit with being united to Jesus. Verse 21 makes this point. Have a look. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. We cannot eat at the table of demons and God. We either follow truth or error. We follow God or Satan. We worship God or we worship Satan. We cannot have a a part in both. It is illogical. It doesn't make sense for the Christian. It cannot happen. Jesus, he says this as well in Matthew 6, verse 24. He says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So you need to ask yourself, are you sitting at two tables? Are you eating at the table of the Lord and the table of demons? Are you a two-faced person who's devoted 
all week to your idols and the gods in your life. And then you come on a Sunday or you get that religious fix by listening to a sermon, by taking the Lord's Supper or doing something else. Your religious practices do not make you safe in your sin. Verses 1 to 13 in this chapter showed how the Old Testament people had spiritual food. They had all these supernatural things, but they weren't safe from God's judgment when they fell in idolatry because of those things. And the, the Corinthians too, they can't digest the disease of idolatry and then just think that through the medication of taking the Lord's Supper or something else, that they're going to be okay. The Lord's Supper isn't like a, a vaccine that protects us from sin and idolatry, no. And it seems it's possible that the Corinthians possibly were thinking like this, but they were wrong. The Lord's Supper doesn't bring healing or immunize us in any way. No, in the Lord's Supper, we are simply proclaiming what we already have in Jesus. We aren't gaining what we don't yet have. Jesus has shed his blood. He has already died and freed us from sin. That's what frees us and protects us. But I think many people in churches today treat religious practices like this and think they can gain this spiritual blessing and forgiveness of sin even through religious practices. People think that coming to church or hearing a sermon or taking the Lord's Supper or being baptized is like the medication that they need to be protected from sin and possibly even forgiven and to be cleansed from sin. They think, I've, I've shown up to church, I've been baptized, I've taken the Lord's Supper, I'm okay, I'm safe because I've done this. And it keeps them happy each week, keeps them content. People focus so much on these religious practices, but they miss out on the focus of fellowshipping with Jesus and being in Him. And then as well, living holy lives that flee from idolatry. Do you treat religious practices like that? Do you treat religious practices like that? We can't. We need to realize we can't partake the Lord's Supper and proclaim the benefits of his death whilst also eating at the table of demons. As Paul says in verse 21, the Christian cannot have a double life where they have one face on Sunday and another face the rest of the week. So you need to check yourselves. Are you sitting at the table of demons with what you watch, with what you listen to, with how you speak, with how you act, the way you use your mouth, with what you devote your time to? Are you eating at the table of demons and then trying to just feast a little bit on God's word or, or say a quick prayer for forgiveness or think, I can listen to that sermon, or I can take the Lord's table and then I feel okay again and then go back to eating at the table of demons, then go back into idolatry, and it's okay. Something is wrong if you are like this. And Paul is showing us here that we cannot, we cannot be like that. We cannot partake in idolatry and still enjoy the blessings of what we have in Jesus. We must flee from idolatry. A genuine Christian will flee from idolatry because God will work that in them. As Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, it shows the need to flee idolatry and live holy lives. It says, we must strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. There is a holiness without which we will not see the Lord. And the genuine Christian must flee idolatry. That's why idolatry is deadly. Because it doesn't fit with being united to Jesus. That was our second point. Now, our third point in the passage, the final verse, idolatry angers the Lord, verse 22. That's why idolatry is deadly. Verse 22 says, Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? God's jealousy, it's, it's a good thing, not like our jealousy and envy at times, uh, and it protects the wonder and truth that God alone is God and He alone is to be wor worshipped. And if anything goes against that, God is jealous for His worship. And when people, in the Old Testament, we see again and again, when people fall into idolatry, it provokes God's jealousy. We see it in Exodus 20, 4-5, the second commandment, how their idolatry and making a carved image will provoke His jealousy. And we see it again and again. And so Paul here is saying, do not fall into idolatry, do not eat in these pagan feasts, Corinthians, because you will anger God. Don't think that you can just get away with it. Don't think that you are stronger than God in some way and that He will let this go. No, the point is God will not 
just let this go. He will not let the sin of idolatry go unpunished. You will not get away with it. He will come against you. And this is why idolatry is so deadly, because it angers God. It provokes His jealousy. So I hope we can see here in the passage that idolatry is deadly stuff. We should not be so relaxed about it as a sin in our life. But now I want to ensure, I want to ensure that we really do see idolatry is in us. It's so easy to miss it in our lives, to not see it and to not spot how it is in our lives. So I want to give you eight quick questions to help you identify your idols. And you'll probably need to come back to these again. Maybe reflect on them and work through, what are my idols? How do I see other gods in my life? How am I devoting myself to other gods? And work through these questions to help you reveal your idols. So here are a few questions to help you identify idolatry. Firstly, where do you put your thoughts, imagination, and attention? Are you always thinking about possessions, success, and pleasing people? Think about that. Secondly, second question, how do you use your spare time? What things do you run to doing rather than being productive for God's kingdom? What are you longing to do when you finish school, when you finish work? Those things will show your idols. When you answer that question, it will show your idols. How do you use your money? A third question, how do you use your money? What drives your decisions for how you spend your money? And what would you do if you had, say, a spare million dollars? What would you do with that money? That will show your idols. Fourth question, what drives your emotions? What do you get angry or emotional over and sad about? Uh, What do you despair over if you lose? What do you rejoice over and get passionate about? What's your heart longing for? What drives your emotions? That will show your idols. A fifth question, what are you fearful of, concerned of, anxious about, worried about? What makes you feel safe and secure so that you aren't, aren't anxious and fearful? That will show whether you pursue idols or whether you have a faith in God. A sixth question, what do you regret in life? What do you wish you could change in the past? What do you long to see happen in the future? That's going to show what you're devoted to and show your idols. A seventh question, what gives your life meaning? What brings fulfillment to your life? What makes you feel like you have value and significance? That will show the gods of our life. And then a final question, I think, to help draw out idolatry and things that can be idols in our lives. An eighth question, we need to ask, does that activity or that person, whatever we're involved in, does it draw you near to God or does it draw you away from Him? Does it draw you near to following and pursuing His kingdom and growing? Or does it take you away from these things and hinder your growth? If it is... It is an idol. It is something we should not want. And it's taking the rightful place of God. So I encourage you, answer those questions honestly in your heart. See what you love and long for through those questions. And it will reveal the idols that may be in your life. It will reveal the gods that you are pursuing. The things that you are devoting yourself to. Examine your life. Pray God would reveal the idols in your life. Because they're hard to see. I've had to work through these questions often oftentimes in my life, to help me see the idols that are in my life. Because they're not easy to see at times. But then as you see them, as you see your idolatry, remember Paul's command back in verse 14, flee. Run. Run from it. Flee from it. Get away. Don't dawdle with idolatry. Don't play with it. Don't see how close you can get to sin. Get as far away from it as possible. And so, as we come to a close... I just want to give us three quick things of how we can battle idolatry. How can we flee? How can we run from idolatry? Three things. I think the first thing, and we've we've seen this in the passage so clearly, we need to see that Satan is subtle in the ways that he works. We we saw that the Corinthians are in fact worshipping demons, participating and eating at the table of demons as they go to those pagan feasts. And we need to see Satan is subtle in how he attacks and how he works through idolatry. If we want to fight and flee from idolatry, we need to see that Satan is subtle. Just last night when I was, I was reading with Pearl a story 
and we were talking about it, came up the, the story of how Peter talks to Jesus after Jesus has said he's going to die and then rise again th- in three days. And Peter says, no, this shouldn't happen. And Jesus has to say to him, get behind me, Satan. You have in mind the things of men, not the things of God. Even Peter was used by Satan there to attack. And, and we know Satan is subtle. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 to 14 say, such men are false apostles, these men who are attacking in the Corinthian church, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And then he says, verse 14, And no wonder they're like this, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan is masquerading himself. He's working, and he may even come and be working in what we see as an angel of light. He's the father of lies. And the the world loves his lies The world loves his lies. We hear so many in our society about sexuality, about abortion, about what is truth. They love his lies and they hate truth. And when Christians speak truth. And we may think that, say, movies, music, our friends, these sort of things, they're just harmless. There's nothing wrong with some of these things. We may think they're okay. But we need to to realize Satan is working. He's working behind these things. He can feed lies and he can breed idolatry in our lives through them. So be on guard. Satan is subtle in how he attacks and works through idolatry. And just to bring this out a little bit more, an example of how Satan is subtle in our lives. One of the key ways he is subtle and brings about idolatry idolatry in our lives is to consume us with this life. He wants us to be consumed with now and what we have now he even makes some Christian organizations fall into this trap where they just come, become all about this life and just making this Western world a paradise. And we become like this too, where we just seek to have safety, security, great health, have a wonderful society here, have a wonderful paradise at our home, and Satan consumes us with this life. Satan is subtle in how he attacks Another example of how Satan attacks before we move on to the next point is in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, we see Paul, Silas, and Timothy longing to to go and see the Thessalonians, but Satan has stopped them. It says, 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 to 18. Brothers, we were torn, when we were torn away from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our Intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did, again and again, but Satan stopped us. These Christians weren't content to be apart, and they, he saw Paul there in some way, somehow, Satan was stopping them from being together. We'll re, we resist those attacks, those subtle attacks, when Satan attacks and when he works through idolatry. But two final things, and we'll move quicker here. How can we battle idolatry? I think a big one is actually putting on the armor of God. When you look at Ephesians 6, you see that the armor of God is given to fight the attacks of spiritual forces. And this means that to flee idolatry, we need to know Ephesians 6. If we know that demonic work is behind idolatry, then Ephesians 6 will help us to fight spiritual forces, to fight the devil to flee as well, therefore, from idolatry. So we need to look at the armor of God. We need to put on truth. We need to put on righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith. We need to put on these things. And particularly, we need to take up the sword of God's word every day if we are to fight idolatry and if we are to fight the spiritual attacks that Satan brings. Take up God's word. Fill your mind with it. Listen to it. Take it up every day. Put it in your pocket on a little note card so you can read it in that day. Put it in your mind and memorize it. Put it on the windowsill as you're doing the dishes. Take God's word with you. Read it to your family so that you can fight idolatry and flee from it. And then a final thing. If we are to flee from idolatry, we need to, first and foremost, delight in Jesus Christ. Delight in Him. See all that there is in Him. Grow in your love for the gospel. See the diamond that Jesus is, and then it will stop you from running from the worthless stones of our idols. See the riches of being in Jesus. See all that you have in Him, the blessings that you have in Him, and your heart will be guarded 
from the measly gods of this world and the weak, pathetic temptations that they bring. See what you have in him. When you see what you have in him, you will not and you should not go to the idols and gods of this world. So as I close, let me help you delight in Jesus and see all that you have in him by reading this passage, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. This is all that we have in Jesus. This is why we should delight in him and this is why we should flee and how we can flee idolatry. See what we have in Christ. Colossians 2, 13 to 15 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. We're alive. Sin has been forgiven. Our sin debt has been nailed to the cross. Demonic powers have been dealt with. The authorities have been dealt with. And we have new affections through God's Spirit. We have all of this in Christ. So cherish all that you have in Him and it will help you flee from idolatry. And if you don't have this, if you don't have all these things we've talked about that are in Christ... If you don't have all these things from being united to him, then come. Unite yourself to Christ in faith, utterly dependent on all that he's done. To deal with that sin debt, to nail it to the cross, unite yourself to faith in him and have all these blessings that come through him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that Though it was written thousands of years ago, there's so much to convict us, so much to challenge us. It is so relevant to this world, this life, all that we are going through now. Please bring wisdom to our minds. Convict, even more particularly, God, in the lives of people, how you need to convict them. Use your spirit to bring about personal application and challenging and conviction that people need. And I pray, God, for any caught up in idolatry, straying from you, for those who are devoting their lives to so many other things, who who are not devoted to you, who who have not united to Christ in faith, please God, turn them from their idols. Help them to see the deadly, worthless nature of their idolatry and turn them to you, that precious diamond. Help them to see the riches that are in you and the blessings that they can have in Christ as their sin debt is nailed to the cross and as they have forgiveness through him. Please, God, if there are any listening who are not saved, bring them to you. Give them faith in Christ and save them. And for us this week, God, we ask that you would help us to flee from idolatry, help us to see the idolatry in our lives, and may we run. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, thank you for listening, and may you have a blessed week and continue in fleeing from idolatry this week.